Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Tonic Accord. We are back from a little bit of a holiday break, and we're back right into the frying pan. Um, it is, you know, Tuesday, January 5th. It is the day of the Georgia Senate runoff election. And normally, no one really cares about kind of Georgia runoffs, but this time, everybody cares. And the reason why is the battle for the Senate um, is like the Senate's controls and is in the hands of whoever wins tonight. Um, if both Republicans win tonight in, this, in Georgia, then the Republicans have control of the Senate. If both Democrats win tonight uh, in Georgia, then Democrats have control of the Senate. So it's, um, it's a big night in politics. And uh, Alex and I are happy to be back at, it, at the podcast. I'm going to be talking a little bit about Georgia and what we expect. <laughs> You know, it is the polls have closed for about an hour. We're just now getting the drip feed of votes. And um, what are your kind of thoughts on this? Like, wh what have you have seen in the last few weeks apart as far as polling and mood? And what are we going to what do we expect to see tonight? Well, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting, man, because I, I think you're right. Is usually a Georgia runoff. I don't think would be getting the coverage that people are seeing right now. And it's, it's interesting because I think both Republicans and Democrats see this as kind of the existential risk to the state of the nation right now. I think both sides are really kind of fired up about this. And to me, it's 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 kind of interesting in a lot of ways. But I just have to say off the bat, I'm glad I'm not voting in this election because I don't know who I would vote for. And I, I know we've talked about that a little bit, but it really seems like we have just completely polar opposite candidates in a predominantly red state. So it's to me, it's just interesting. And and the one thing I do want to say, actually, is that polls were supposed to close an hour ago. But I guess in certain counties, they're actually keeping them open till about one or two in the morning, at least according to what 538 was saying, because they actually want to get this election as far along as possible. Um, because, you know, all day people have been saying, oh, this is, you know, it's going to take take days to get the results. And I think people after seeing what happened on November 3rd and kind of the chaos that surrounded the, you know, the false information after it, I think they want to try to get this as streamlined as possible. Now, that's easier said than done. Um, it's it's just going to be really interesting to me. Like, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to see if if Georgia actually rejects um, kind of these these Democrat candidates who are no centrist by any means. And if they stick with kind of the establishment Republicans. Or are they going to switch? So that's kind of my takeaway. I mean, I I think Republicans actually are kind of in a tough corner right now because Trump is, you know, as we've talked about, he's dominating the party and he's told people not to vote. He's called the election fraudulent. But then at the same time, let's be honest, Republicans need to win this, I think, just to kind of squeak by as a party. And so I'm curious if Trump's going to damage this or help this. Um, yeah, I think you, you touched on a really interesting point is that um – this, this is a new kind of politics being played in Georgia. Like you had mentioned, both Democratic candidates are not centrists by any means. And usually in Georgia, they have been um, for the past. I mean, you know, you, you posted that article, but we, we've been talking about this theme for a bit uh, in regards to, you know, flipping some states back blue is, um, especially in the South, is like for a long time, Democrats in the South thought that, you know, in, the South was increasingly going red. And in order to win, they would need to get, you know, a, a, a blue dog Democrat, someone like Joe Manchin. I mean, Joe Manchin has had success. So, you know, I could see why maybe you think that would work. Uh, and they think, you know, get a white guy who's a centrist, who's maybe a little bit blue dog. Well, in fact, what we're seeing now is the reason that Georgia is actually a toss up. I mean, the New York Times had it literally as just a coin toss. Uh, in the last few weeks is 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 interesting because the Democrats are not going by that same route. You have a black preacher who is coming from a church who's that's known for social justice, being very progressive. You have Ossoff, who you know has worked with progressive um, senators. That's how we got to start with uh, Clark. Uh, sorry, what's the guy's name? Lewis. Um, ah, <laughs> yeah, and so you know. Like it's 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 a it's a new ball game. People like Stacey Abrams have trying to change the strategy into like let's bring out a base of, um, of you know a coalition of multi ethnic voters, but especially in Georgia, mostly black. Right? You if you're a Democrat, you need to have a large black vote come out and support you to win in this state. And we're seeing that happen, and we're seeing that people like Stacey Abrams push for that. Um, just a, just between the November and now. Stacey Abrams has registered 100,000 new voters, you know, since since the, the general. 
So I think that what we're seeing is um, a, a shift in, in democratic strategy. Uh, you, it's a, it's a new ball game. It's it's no longer let's let's go to the middle and let's persuade. I had that that catching up where I mentioned this a little bit about persuasion versus motivating your base. And the Democrats used to always be persuading in the South. Please, please go for our, our milk toast white guy. That's kind of Democrat, but kind of Republican. <laughs> and for a while they said no. But this time they're saying, no, let's go for building a big, strong base and increasing that base through outreach efforts and like getting people to register to vote. And we'll see if it pays off. It's certainly changed Georgia blue for the presidential. Now, will these candidates outperform Biden, um, uh, you know, in this runoff? Yeah, I think you touched on a, a really interesting thing, which I've kind of, I didn't honestly, like if you asked me a year ago, I didn't know anything about this, but it's something over the last few weeks I've kind of been looking into. And it really is how the Democratic Party inside of Georgia, they've changed their strategy. It really is a ground up movement of just getting people out there and getting people energized. And I, I'm sure you're aware of this, but I just really quickly, like uh, it was something I, I just read about a few weeks ago that I thought was fascinating is that until the early 2000s, the Democratic Party actually had a loose coalition that ran the state's governor office since uh, I think it was what, 1871. So the Democratic Party controlled Georgia's uh, governor's office for 130 years. And but the problem was, is that they had such a loose coalition, kind of what you were talking about, where it was kind of these milk toast politicians who, you know, some were almost right. Some were progressives and they were just kind of stuck together by this loosely tied affiliation of being Democrats. And then that all kind of changed in 2002 when Republicans actually took the governor's seat and then they took the state Senate. And basically then the, then the Republican Party just took over control. And basically Stacey Abrams was one of the people who basically just said, hey, we need to we need to fix this because we don't have a coalition as a Democratic Party right now. And I don't agree with her politics specifically on some certain issues, which we could get into. But I, I do. I think she's done something quite remarkable in getting people out to vote because Georgia, I don't think it's any miss any secret that, you know, Georgia's voter suppression activities are quite nefarious in the state. So it's really interesting to me that we are just seeing a total shift. What I what I wonder is, is someone like Ossoff or Warnock, are they the right ones to maybe like bridge this gap and get people out? Because I know Warnock, for example, is super popular. And, you know, he's he's a reverend at Martin Luther King Jr.'s old church. So obviously he has a very strong following on that side of it. But he said some stuff over the years that if I was a moderate voter in Georgia would kind of scare me. You know, he said that you can't be a good Christian and in the military. He's he's, um, you know, had disdain for Israel, supported Palestine. He's he said, goddamn America, like 9-11 was kind of well, well, he didn't say that, but he's backed up Reverend Wright's uh, statements about how 9-11 was kind of a reckoning. And unlike Obama, he has um, kind of stuck with these comments and not really condemned any of them. So he is quite a progressive for a state that has a large military presence, quite kind of traditional values. Obviously, not everyone, but I'm just saying that it's an, he's an interesting choice. And so my lens for this is really on Warnock and Loeffler. Yeah, that's interesting because um, what, like Warnock, I would say, was is probably the more fiery, progressive, um, what may be viewed as inflammatory, like as far as remarks, you know, against like police and stuff, right? You're right that like, you know, he – He's the less milk toast candidate of the two, right? You know, Ossoff is more like reserved and, 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 and more centrist in his uh, m mannerisms, I guess. He's still kind of like, he's still pretty liberal. But, um, but, but what's interesting, though, is from what we're seeing in polling, again, that polling, we've had that conversation of how you can't trust it all the way. Of course not. But we're seeing that Loeffler has a, probably the harder race, right? It looks like <laughs> Purdue, you know, Purdue is looking pretty good. Um, and Ossoff has a h higher hill to climb, whereas Loeffler, see, the thing is, is it, I wonder if it was like switched the who, who is versus who, because you're right. Warnock made a, w a bunch of crazy statements and, you know, connections to churches that invited Fidel Castro, like things that Americans get really freaked out about. Right. Communism, calling cops things, calling military things. But on the other hand, Loeffler is a pretty problematic candidate herself. She's gotten in a lot of hot water over, you know, selling a lot of stock. Uh, at the beginning of the COVID crash, you know, before the, the the stock market crashed, while the Senate was still telling people that you know, COVID won't won't matter, um, she's gotten a lot of flack very recently over these stimulus checks, and that and I think that's a huge development in the last few weeks that 
actually gives the, uh, the Democrats a chance. Now, it's still unlikely, but I think a two, three months ago, I mean, you know, if, if I had to put money down, I'm putting money down on the Republicans to take this thing. Within the last few weeks, the battle over these direct payments, right, um, and the fact that Trump, you know, kind of pulled a fast one on Republicans and said, no, actually, we want two two thousand dollar checks. And Mitch McConnell said no, right? It put Republicans in this weird spot where now you have a, a the narrative that Warnock and Ossoff have been hammering home the last few weeks is, look, if you want two thousand dollar direct payments, you vote blue. If you don't, if you if you don't want help, if guess if you don't need help, then keep going with the, the Republicans. But Loeffler and Purdue will block your direct payments. Now, you can argue, you know, the philosophical part of you know, basically paying, like voting for your own po pocketbook, but that's the way it goes often is people vote for their own pocketbook. And especially in a crisis when people are really hurting, I can see how even someone who's like a Republican, that's like, ah, maybe I don't like those PC AOC thought police, but I'm struggling right now. And I kind of want my direct payment. They'll, they might vote for Warnock. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen just anecdotal cases. I think it was on CNN or something. doesn't really matter. But there are a decent amount of like working class white Georgia voters who said I'm voting Democrat in this just because the the chaos is too much to handle. Um, and and you're I, I think you're absolutely right that Warnock really, to me, is the more controversial character. I mean, even, even there's tape of domestic violence with his wife that I mean, I don't want to get I, I mean, Trump and Republicans do the same thing, but he is more controversial. But I'm looking right now, the AP's just live election results, you know, so far with 32% um, reporting in. And Ossoff is is quite close. It's 51.5% to 48. Um, he's he's winning with 683, over 683,000 votes to right. 643,000, which Purdue has. But then if you look at Warnock and uh, Loeffler, it's 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 actually growing to almost a four percent difference so far, and it's it's fascinating to me. But you know, you and I talked, I think, a couple of weeks ago about kind of the criticism, even the Greek criticism of democracy, and I almost feel like this election is actually almost the 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 kind of analysis of that to a certain extent, where because basically the Greek comparison was is that over time democracy gets stagnant and extreme and very divided. And I feel like that's where we're at now. We're, we're like at a 50-50 of the nation. And we have Warnock and Loeffler, who she's this corrupt kind of crony corporate Republican. And he's kind of a pretty radical liberal. I mean, I know I don't like to call him that just because she's called him that so many times. But literally, they're the two most extreme examples. And and it's that's the choice that the American people are being given because our system is so broken on compromise that we just have these extremes. And it, it kind of bums me out to see that because I don't know which one I would vote for, to be honest. But I, I think you're also right is that Trump's not made this any better after this $2,000 stimulus check problem because what are the, I mean, the voters are probably just up in arms. They're like, what the hell is happening anymore? You know, so it's, it, it's interesting. And, but now the inter, okay, now the other thing that fascinates me, I guess, is last night I, I guess, tortured myself and watched some of Trump's rally uh, where he was supposed to be propping up Purdue and Loeffler. But the crowd was like dead every time he brought up Loeffler and Purdue. Mm. Like there was no excitement about them. But every time he brought up his election and that he was going to still challenge and he'd be in the White House and, you know, the Kraken's still coming, the crowd was crazy. And the only time Loeffler got applause is when she said that she's going to challenge the electoral votes in the Senate. So yes. I'm just I, I'm just curious. I don't really know if Trump is helping the case because at least his base, I don't know if they're really going to be too mobilized. Well, you, you, that observation is, is, will explain why you have 140 Republicans not going to certify this election, right? You know, like, I, I view it as like, dude, the Trump train's over, right? Trump, I mean, he's still very loud, but he, he's going to be gone in a few years. But there's obviously enough Republicans that believe that the Trumpism, the Trump thing, it will continue at least until 22 and 24 when some of these guys are going to need to get reelected. And so, like, they're still playing ball with it. They obviously want to appease Trump's base. And you said it. People don't give a, like, part of my French, but people don't give a rat's ass about Kelly Loeffler. They care about Trump. And is and that's why, like, it's, it's obvious now that these Republican politicians are seeing that, like, wow, there's so many voters that really don't care about me personally. They just care about Trump and what he represents. And I have to latch on to that, even if it's a dying, like, even if he lost, like, he, he did lose. He's... So, sorry, you lost, but they're attaching themselves to a cart that's falling off of the cliff because there's no other option. There's no other carts to attach onto. Republican voters have shown 
that they do not care about the GOP establishment anymore at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. And I, I think I think it's going to be a tough time for them. Like, that's why I, I kind of said at the beginning that I think if if Republicans can just squeak this out, then maybe they can continue to be in denial that they're a unified party. But right. if, if, you know, like, I, I think they're in denial right now, man. Like, I, I really do. And, and I think, I think, like you said, a lot of them think it's a litmus test at this point. Um, but now, but now the interesting thing is you have people then like Tom Cotton who actually aren't going to challenge it. Uh, and he's obviously an avid Trump supporter, but he's smart enough to know that this precedent is dangerous. And I, I, I hope more see that, but I think you're right is that these guys are doing what they think is best and it's very anti-democratic in a lot of ways but it's it's what's going to get them you know um and oh boy i'm looking here now uh Ossoff's now up almost 11 points to 10 percent david Perdue. yeah now, but, we have to look, but we have to see what is like what is in though from from that race right. because right um you know as far as democrats need to do really good in dekalb and fulton and you need right to, and i think they need to do better like I think that Trump got 16% of DeKalb County. Now right now Purdue only has 13% of DeKalb County. So that, so Ossoff's looking good, but only 28% is in. So within the next, you know, if Purdue squeaks up to 20, 21% in DeKalb, Ossoff's in trouble, right? So um, you know, similar to and I know you know this, but for the viewers, similar to the general election, right? It might look like something's changing. It's just what count, over time what's being counted. So right now, Ossoff is up 10 points, but I imagine that that lead will that drastically shrink whenever we start to get especially these more rural red counties that are going to be deep red that are, are not even, um, you know, there's a lot of these rural counties that are 0% in, and they're going to be overwhelmingly red. So we really don't have a full idea yet, but I think it's what's what that's why it's important to look at some of these live feed tickers from like 548 you get like Nate Silver, Nate Cohn from New York Times. They'll tell you, um, you know, a little bit about what the percentages will really mean. So look like, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, it's he, a great one. Yeah, I see. You know, no, he says here, like, no, nothing should make you feel like this race is in the bag for Democrats. Like, of course not. No, this this race is going to be a long toss up. And again, we still have to remember that I think some of the provisional ballots and absentee ballots aren't even going to be counted in, until Friday. It's what, mm -hmm. it's what I heard. I think some of them. So we may not even get an idea until later this week again. Yeah, and I, I believe it's until Friday that military people overseas or in different parts of the country can still you know be counted by up to Friday. So yeah, it's... It's going to be interesting. What what I'm curious about is I wonder if Republicans learned from the general election back in November and maybe tried to do more mail in voting because, you know, um, or, or, or no, sorry, <laughs> sorry, the opposite. I, I I wonder if if everyone is trying to do more in person voting on the day of to get the results counted quicker. Yeah. Uh, I, mm. I just wonder that because. Obviously, I don't think anyone wants this drawn out chaos again, which it probably will be. But I, I just wonder if people have taken anything into consideration following the last election. But, you know, who knows? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but, that's an interesting point, right? That's an interesting point, especially the Republican side. If you like if you really believe that these mail in votes are fraudulent, um, you know, maybe you really you like, like 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 obviously that narrative affected the mail in votes in the general. We saw that happen. We everyone predicted that red wave, and I imagine it might be even stronger here, like where like um, in, in the in the sense it's stronger for the Republicans in the sense that like a lot of people like, you know, oh, Warnock's polling better in the early votes, but the Republicans come out day of and really hammer it home. It's hard to say. I, I think, though, that, you know, the the direct payments issue will, will sway people that are not that political and ideological. A lot of people that are just struggling that really don't care too much, but maybe they still want to vote anyway. I do think that do, do you want to talk about money talks, that direct payment will be a problem for Republicans. And I'm looking here, um, uh, Laura Bronner from 538 saying that looking at the counties where more than 99% of the expected vote is reported, we see a pattern. Both Ossoff and Warnock are slightly overperforming Biden's vote share in November, which is mm. bad, bad news if you're a Republican. Um, because you not only need to, obviously if you're a Republican, like, like, like if you're a Democrat, you need to at least tie what Biden did, obviously, because Biden won the state. If you're doing better than Biden, you're doing real good. Because, you know, the, the bad sign would be if Ossoff and Warnock are underperforming Biden. 
Uh, and it seems like they're doing better than Biden did, which is bad news for Republicans. But again, it's early in the night. There's a lot of stuff to let left be counted. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's going to be interesting because and, and kind of, you know, kind of going off of that, I I think you're right, is that what Ossoff especially needs to do is I think he needs to do well in the suburbs outside of Atlanta, which yes. which it's which we haven't seen a lot yet. But I yeah, I, I think it is going to be interesting now on a philosophical question about this. Um, this is kind of, you know, me is, I guess, kind of an independent. I don't know. Well, how do you feel, though, about Democrats controlling all three houses of the government? Uh, you know what, man? Like, uh, I don't buy the argument anymore that a split government is a better government. I've seen so much gridlock and roadblock um, that it just it just it doesn't it's it because it, the thing is like the idea is like oh like you'll be forced to compromise, but I don't see that. I don't see Mitch McConnell compromising at all. I see Mitch McConnell just blocking stuff. He he's he has shown time and time and again with hundreds of examples that he he doesn't feel confident in even voting on things he just won't vote things he just won't even put things on the floor so even if even if it's like hey like I mean, maybe we should have voted on this thing and hey if it doesn't get voted on hey whatever he won't even vote on it so i don't see like to me that's not a sign of like good efficient practical government with compromise to me it's a petulant child not playing handball because he just <laughs> happens to own the handball court i think it would be better for the country as a whole if Mitch McConnell lost his power in the Senate as the Senate majority leader. Um, and yeah, that's, that's fair. And I, and I even think like, you know, sure, obviously I lean left. So I want, you know, I think it would be a lot easier to get left leaning policy passed. But even when I talk to Republicans in my family and friends, you know, nobody likes these super old guys and gals like deciding things for these parties it mitch mcconnell has had way too much power for too long nancy pelosi has had way too much power for too long diane feinstein has had way too much power for too long like there's this class of elite senate and and house of representative old timers that just need to go and if mitch mcconnell's next on the chopping block oh, i say go for it <laughs> hey hey that's fair i yeah i I think that kind of the end of the idea of the or at least the efficacy of a split government would probably be, you know, the Newt Gingrich days where where you, you know, during the early days of Bill Clinton's presidency, I, I really do think split government worked. But towards the end, I think you saw the kind of Newt Gingrich conspiratorial, like the Buchanan esque type of politicians start to rise, that it was more about owning the libs. It was that cultural Cultural war. Cultural sep yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, I, I'm actually reading a book that is not popular. Um, it's it's called The New Right by Michael Malice. I, I don't agree with most of it, but I, I, I like to hear, you know, ideas from these message boards of, of why people are changing and why the energy is changing in the room. And it it really sounds like the 90s was a time where, yeah, people realized that these these establishment elites on both sides are the same thing, you know. And and so that's why I, I back to this election, I, I really do wonder, <laughs> like, if if Republicans, especially the Trump base, kind of the alt right and the new right, really care who wins this, because I think to them it's more bringing down the system than keeping the system. I, I don't mean, know. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, look, if you're if you're if you're a Republican politician, um, you want to win these. If you're Mitch McConnell, you want to maintain your power. But if you're like a commentator, if you're like a, in my opinion, a grifter like Alex Jones, um, but if you're like some kind of commentator on the right. You might need, like, it might actually be better for you if the Democrats take control. I mean, there is nothing better for, mm -hmm. you know, counterculture commentary than an absolutely Democratic stacked d government. Anytime there's any kind of mess up, you could blame all the Democrats, right? I mean, you know, Fox News is going to, Fox News is probably going to do great in the era of Biden, you know, is, um, if it's like a bunch of, if there's scandals and he slips up his words, which I'm sure he will. You know, so I, I don't know. I mean, like as far as the Republican industry, <laughs> the, the money making behind <laughs> being like the money making behind being the new the new right. Um, I think you're good either way. And then, so that's kind of that's kind of to mirror what you're saying is the alt right is good either way. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> Trumpism is going to stay alive. Um, but let's say both Republicans lose, which is which is uh, admittedly unlikely. But let's say both Republicans lose. Uh, I think you're going to have a huge schism, even more so than we've already seen in the Republicans, where it's like, dude, we got to drop this weird crap quick because we just lost Georgia completely. If the Republicans win, which is very likely, 
then Trumpism is here to stay. And I think it's going to be a longer, a longer transition out of the whole Trump Republican Party, probably a good eight to 12 years before you get out of that crap. Yeah, and I have more to say about this in maybe our next episode that we're doing on our predictions of for the year. But, you know, I, I actually have a more negative view where I think that Trumpism itself is kind of a mixture of kind of the alt right from the night like that Buchanan that Buchanan era 90s kind of anti-establishment mixed with libertarianism and trolling. And I almost feel like Trump is almost just the poster child of it, but it's not going away anytime soon. And like that yeah. book I'm reading by Michael Malice, The New Right, like he's a controversial figure. And I'll put that out there. I don't support most of his views, but he joined all these message boards like 4chan and all those other ones. And he talked to alt-right people. And to him, it sounds like the movement's only growing, not getting smaller. And that's my very pessimistic view, but I, I think this is here to stay and it might just accelerate because this is something I've, I've been thinking is that is Trumpism better in the spotlight or in the shadows? And it's something that I struggle with because I don't know which one is better. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess it's only been in the spotlight um, and we're about to find out what it's like in the shadows. <laughs> yeah. Um, with yeah. that, though, we we'll probably wrap this episode up. Obviously, you know, we don't have the results of Georgia when we put this up. If you're listening to it very quickly, then you'll be up to date. If you're listening to it in a few days from now, you know, things may have changed, obviously. So we're not predicting anything. If I had to, I would probably like if I think if I had to, the way things are going, I bet you like one of them, like one Republican wins, one Democrat. I, I bet you like Purdue wins and then Warnock wins. That, that that's interesting. Yeah, I I mean, just looking at it here, I, I honestly I can't really say, it's but I. Early, yeah. I, I almost think that uh, <laughs> I think Purdue at least has more experience as a senator and Ossoff is very underexperienced. And I think he kind of image wise, like I think he's a very good orator. But at the end of the day, to me, he comes off as what a lot of people in the culture war don't like, which is just that kind of young, wealthy progressive. Yeah. Um, and, and but you're right. And so I would probably take, yeah, Purdue and Warnock because Loeffler, she didn't even win the, the last special what special election, whatever. She was just kind of assigned it from Georgia's upper government. So she's never actually been elected as a senator right. and she's quite unpopular. And I, I just find her kind of toxic. So yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I'm going to go Warnock and Purdue. Let's go with that. <laughs> let's see. Let's see if we're right. Let's see if we're right. I can't wait to find out how wrong we are. Um, <laughs> Well, that's going to wrap up this episode. If you are watching live, we're going to continue on to into our next recording. And then obviously, if you're watching, uh, you know, on YouTube or on Tonic Accord, you know, we'll have another episode about our predictions for the year, similar to what we did at the beginning of 2020. And boy, what a, what a year that was. Um, so, yeah, stay tuned. Thank you all. Cool.